The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Oh, hell no! Whatever! The following program contains opinions expressed by The Dead Zone. If you find this broadcast offensive, <laughs> lighten up, candy ass. What? Oh my gosh. It's a radio show. Hell yeah! That's what I'm talking about. Power up request received. Initiating systems. Powering up transmitters. Welcome to the dead zone. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Heal face. Dead Zone Paranormal Radio Show. Thanks for sticking around. Thanks for tuning in. Tonight we're going to have an old friend of the show, Keith Evans. He's an author and a paranormal... Re- par- I, I did it again. Oh my gosh. A paranormal... Paranormal researcher. Lord. And Michelle, of course, with the paranormal news. And we're going to throw in a track or two from maybe Void Vader or some of our other house bands. So stick around. Enjoy it.
what's going on, guys? This is your man, Vincent M. Ward, and you're listening to The Dead Zone. Paranormal News. <laughs> Hey guys, I was doing some research trying to find a recent paranormal news article that I could read for you guys and talk about, but I really only found one that was of any interest to me on Coast to Coast AM. This was posted June 17th, 2021. Murder suspect in England blames centuries old chin for double slaying. A murder suspect in England has put forth forward rather something of a strange supernatural defense for a double slaying that he is accused of committing as the man contends that a centuries old gin is really responsible for the crime. According to a local media report, uh, here we go again with names that I cannot pronounce, Shabaz Khan is currently on trial for the murders of Dr. Saman Mir Sat- Carvey and her daughter Vian Mongrio, who were killed in October of 2020 in the community of Burnley. A contractor by trade who had done previous work at the family's home, he had been seen entering the residence on the day prior to the crime and in a subsequent search of his house was discovered to be in possession of jewelry and money that had belonged to Dr. Sicarvi. Prosecutors in England understandably believe that they have an airtight case against Khan, which likely explains why he contends that a jinn was actually to blame for the double murder. Upon his arrest, Khan was placed in a jail cell, wherein he threw himself across the room and onto his bed in an incident that he claimed was an attack by an invisible evil entity. In an interview with police the next day, the accused killer began undulating and informed them that they were speaking to a 620-year-old supernatural spirit named Robert Smith Wood, who happened to live in Dr. Sicarvi's home. The entity went on to claim that he had grown upset with alterations made to the residence and, in turn, smashed a mirror as well as moved a table to indicate his displeasure with the changes. At some point following the interview, Khan apparently reclaimed control of his body as he later insisted that he had no idea how the mother and daughter were killed. Asserting that they were perfectly fine when he left the residence, he argued that the jinn infesting their home must have committed the crime. As one might imagine, prosecutors are not buying Khan's story, arguing to the jury at his currently unfolding trial that the man's actions while in custody were simply his way of trying to set up his defense to say he had been attacked in his cell by a supernatural spirit. They went on to muse to the court, was it really in his head, or was it real in his head that he threw himself across his cell to his bed, or was it a feeble attempt to pretend there was something wrong with his mental state? Ultimately, they called Khan's defense absolute nonsense, declaring that Dr. Sakarvi and her daughter were not killed by supernatural spirits. Beyond the pilfered property found in the man's possession, Prosecutors also suggest premeditation on the part of the accused killer as, following the double murder, the family's home had been set on fire, while Webb searches on his phone centered around whether or not fire could destroy DNA. And so, unless Khan's attorney can somehow find a way to get Robert the Jinn to take the stand, he's likely to be headed off to prison in the not-too-distant future. Now, I tried to find out if there were any other recent reports of demonic possession being claimed as the reasoning behind their actions. And what I did find was on WOWO.com. This is a radio station. They did a very short story back in November 15, 2018, called Suspect Claims Demonic Possession in Murder Case. This was in Fort Wayne, Indiana. A Fort Wayne man accused of murdering his own mother last month told police he was possessed by demons and Adolf Hitler. That's according to court documents in the case of 34-year-old Jason Stace. The Journal Gazette reports his lawyer filed the documents to ask a judge for a mental evaluation in order to see if he is competent to stand trial. 
The paper reports his attorney also indicated that they'll be relying on a defense of mental disease or defect. Police say that he admitted to punching, biting, and choking Joy Stace in their home on October 24th. So then I found another one. Uh, this is on NBCWashington.com. And this one, hold on, got to scroll up. This one was dated May 24th, 2018. Suspected gunman spoke online about demon possession. The man suspected of shooting three people inside an Oklahoma City restaurant before being fatally shot by bystanders had no obvious connection to the victims or the restaurant and was legally authorized to carry a firearm. Investigators are trying to determine a motive behind the Thursday night attack that wounded four people, according to Oklahoma City Police Captain Bo Matthews. He said the only interaction police had with the suspected gunman, 28-year-old Alexander Tilgman, <clears throat> excuse me, was during a domestic assault and battery call when Tilgman was 13. A police report from that 2003 incident indicates that Tilgman was arrested after his mother told police he punched her several times during a dispute over a vacuum cleaner. Mm -hmm. Matthew said Thursday's shooting appeared to be random, but noted that Tilgman drove to the restaurant and wore protective gear for his ears and eyes. It looked like his mind was made up that he was going to discharge his firearm once he got there. Matthew stressed that the investigation was ongoing and confirmed that Tilgman's mental health was being looked into. On a Facebook page that police said belonged to Tilgman, the man posted a video in which he claims his television is possessed by the devil. The page uses the same profile photo as a YouTube channel where a man that appears to be Tilgman also describes demons possessing his TV and being surrounded by computers. He calmly begs for help from a real human, saying he's suicidal, lonely, and really losing it. The director of the LGBT rights group Freedom Oklahoma, Troy Stevenson, said Tilgman is the same man who distributed flyers across Oklahoma City earlier this year warning of demons taking over people's bodies, and a reporter with the LGBT publication The Gaily conducted an interview in January with Tilgman who warned of demons in clone transsexual bodies. Flyers with similar messages were plastered all over a vehicle that Tilgman drove, said Ryan Bulak, who said he frequently saw Tilgman at his apartment complex in northwest Oklahoma City. Bulak said he saw Tilgman acting strangely Wednesday night. He was twitchy, grabbing his hair, and acting weird. I was uncomfortable and definitely wanted to get away from him. A man who identified himself as Tilgman's brother told television station KOCO that Tilgman needed mental health treatment, saying nobody reached out to him, you know, he was crying for help. Tilgman was licensed as an armed security guard, which authorized him to carry a firearm, said Gerald, Ger, sorry, Gerald Conkler, general counselor for the Oklahoma Council on Law Enforcement Education and Training. The council certifies law enforcement officers and other armed personnel across the state. Obtaining such a license requires a background check and at least 72 hours of training. A woman who answered the phone at the home belong, believed to belong to Tilgman's mother declined to comment when contacted by the Associated Press. Police said Tilgman was armed with a pistol when he opened fire inside Louis on the Lake around 6.30 p.m. on that Thursday. A 39-year-old woman and two girls were shot and wounded while an unarmed man broke his arm while trying to flee. All four victims were in good condition Friday, according to the police. Matthews, the police spokesman, praised the two citizens who retrieved firearms from their vehicles and shot Tilgman outside the restaurant. They were able to shoot the suspect and put an end to a very dangerous situation. Now, this story goes on quite a bit longer. So, if you are interested in reading that, again, that is on NBCWashington.com. Your source for everything paranormal, Para-X. Now, the next story that I picked is one that's known a little bit more. 
This is the Hartford Current. The killer's defense was demon possession. This was dated April 12, 2014, but the incident took place quite a bit before that. At first, the 1981 stabbing death of 40-year-old Alan Bono of Brookfield looked like a routine argument gone awry. Police referred to it as an open and shut case. But then came Arnie Cheyenne Johnson's defense, the devil made him do it. With the help of a pair of famed paranormal investigators, Johnson's defense attorneys sought to prove the 19-year-old killer was innocent because he had been possessed at the time of the killing. It would be the first time a possession defense was used in an American courtroom. Bono was stabbed several times in the chest and stomach on the lawn of Brookfield Kennels, which he managed around 6.30 p.m. on February 16, 1981. About an hour later, police arrested Johnson, described as a small, blonde, fair-skinned man, on a murder charge. The two men had allegedly been, been arguing over Johnson's girlfriend before the stabbing occurred. Days after the stabbing, clergy members, paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren, Johnson's mother and his girlfriend all claimed Johnson had been possessed at the time of the killing. The Warrens told police that since July 1980, Johnson had participated in at least three exorcisms involving his girlfriend's 11-year-old brother, David, who purportedly had been inhabited by 43 demons. During one of the rites, the Warrens told police, Johnson leapt up and cried to the demon, Come into me, I'll fight you, come into me. The current reported on February 27, 1981. From that time on, he was possessed, they said. Although police ordinarily would disregard such unusual claims, the Bridgeport, here's another one, diocese's involvement changed things. Brookfield priests called in the diocese after they heard the 11-year-old story. He had recently entered a Newton house, sat on a waterbed, and suddenly was confronted by an elderly man with hooves whose image was soon joined by men in grotesque costumes, the Warrens told police, according to the current. current. Shortly after Bono was killed, the diocese stopped commenting on the boy's case, but a spokesman did acknowledge that a priest had been assigned to investigate the boy. The spokesman told the current it was the first time the diocese had assigned an investigator to look into diabolical possession. Johnson was present for the exorcisms and soon began to display violent behavior. At one point, he reportedly put his fist through a chest of drawers, growling like an animal, and then couldn't remember the incident, the current reported. We knew this case would end in tragedy. It was inevitable, Lorraine Warren told The Current. But Arnie was the last one we would have ever thought it could happen to. Before Johnson was indicated on March 19, 1981, Waterbury lawyer, lawyer Martin J. Manella offered to take on his case for free. Manella's plan to pursue the unprecedented demon possession defense was widely publicized. Manella said he hoped to subpoena the priest involved in the exorcism and hoped they would break tradition and speak about the rites. Though police investigated the Warrens' claims, they maintained that Bono was stabbed after a fight over Deborah Glassell, Johnson's 26-year-old girlfriend. In April, Johnson's lawyers gained permission to examine the clothing and tissue remains of Bono who had been cremated. They said the absence of blood, rips, or wounds could prove that de demons were involved. As the case progressed toward trial, the Warrens and Manila drew criticism from their peers who said they were involved in the case for personal gain. Typical of the criticism of the Warrens are comments by mental mentalist George Kresge, better known as the Amazing Kreskin, who argues that the Brookfield case is simply a means for the couple to prey on the superstitions of the public and build up their annual lecture revenues. They have an excellent vaudeville act, a good road show. It's just that this case more involves clinical psychologists than it does them, Kresge told, said in his, in his story. Local attorneys said Manila was press, representing Johnson to rake in the publicity and that the legal community didn't take the possession defense seriously. Both the Warrens and Manila stood by their involvement in this case. Now, if you hadn't heard about this story, this is where the conjuring had come from. 
was the story behind this was the story behind that movie and book anyway i hope that you uh you enjoyed this if you'd like to read the rest of that story that's on current.com c-o-u-r-a-n-t.com and that is it for this week i hope you enjoyed the three parts of this story actually i guess there were four the four parts of this story and anyway if you know of any real demonic possession that caused people to act out of character email me at michelle.deadzone at gmail.com. M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E dot deadzone at gmail.com. Thanks so much, guys. Hello, this is Christopher St. Booth, and you're listening to The Dead Zone. All radio stations in town were palm trees. We'd be the one with the biggest coconuts. Now. Here are the one, the only Dead Zone. Dead Zone. Okay, let's get Keith on the phone. All right, it's ringing. Hello. Okay, can still can barely barely hear you. Can you hear me better now? Very little. Can you hear me better now? Now that's a little better. Yeah. What'd you do different? Uh, I'm not sure. Actually, I that's... can hear you better too. Okay, actually, that's that's much better now. I think we're maybe okay. it takes time to warm up. I don't. Well, like I said, like I told you before, I called. We were having some issues with the with the software here, so maybe that was part of the problem too. But yeah, I can hear you great now. So anyway, that's good. All right. So anyway, Keith Evans, little friend of the show, an author, and a paranormal researcher as well. And you have two books: The House of Hayes and Ghost or People Two. So what's been going on, man? Not much. Um doing paranormal research in a couple different places and it's keeping me busy right so what's been happening anything good anything uh, you can talk about well um i've been going to the uh graveside of dr john gory uh in apalachicola florida okay Fill us and in. um uh, who, who, i just started taking my uh obelisk 5b and nothing else and i've been getting a lot of uh, activity a lot of uh, ghosts and spirits are choosing words uh, and um, I don't think it's just one ghost or spirit I think it's a multiple group of ghosts and spirits but right. I try to go once a week and it seems like they're expecting me oh, yeah. you know so they're kind of like gathered around in a group right. and I try to go underneath the shade tree because um, I'm 62 and the sun gets hot in Florida oh Okay, yeah, I completely understand that, yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so, uh, um, well, first of all... I, who, I will say... Go ahead. I usually take two or three pieces of equipment with me, and it's like the ghosts of spirits are kind of drawn between, you know, whether they should use the Melmeter or the uh, Obelisk 5 or my uh, thermal imager. All right. And um, I find... When I go to Dr. John Gorey's grave, if I just take the uh, Obelisk 5, then they all zero in on that one piece of equipment. You're right. And it makes for better paranormal activity. Right. And it, for those of you that don't know, I'm sure if you're listening to this show, you know what an Obelisk is, right? So we're not even going to bother to explain that. I, well, I, I would hope that you do. Anyway, what I was going to ask, though, um, who is this person, Dr. John what was it? Uh, Gory. He uh, come up with the patent ideas for mechanical refrigeration and mechanical freezing. Okay. He was a doctor of what? Uh, he was a, actually a medical doctor. Okay. So, oh, so... But he also was an inventor. Okay. So he more or less came up with the uh, idea of freezing a body, keeping it, a morgue, basically keeping it cold. Keeping it on ice, so to speak. So yeah, to speak. back in, uh, I think his patent was uh, documented back in like 1850. And he was kind of motivated by the yellow fever uh, uh, illness that was going around in Florida and killing a lot of people. Right. And his theory was if he could keep the patients cool, they might be able to survive yellow fever. 
Oh, I see. So that's when he came up with the ideal for, uh, you know, commercializing uh, mechanical refrigeration and also mechanical freezing. Right. More or less the refrigerator and the freezer. Right. Well, that's interesting. You learn something new every but day, right? The Obelisk 5, the, the Obelisk 5, for those of you that don't, you know, haven't been familiar with it, it's like a um, mechanical device that ghosts to spirits theoretically can use their energy to choose words from the uh, database. Obelisk 5. Right. The Obelisk. Other than that, um, that's the only theory that I know as far as how it works. Right. The Obelisk has a, a, a predetermined database. So they theoretically can go through that database of words, pick those words, and have them appear on, on the uh, digital screen. Right. But I, I, I will say one thing um most ghosts and spirits it takes a lot of energy for them to use the obelisk five so when they start to use it a lot of times they burn out they use all their energy up right i mean we've we've had a lot of luck with the old uh, k5 um some really interesting hits on it and some some what would seem to be intelligent responses with it and that's pretty cool i mean that's that's Compared to the obvious, that's obvious. I'm sorry. I mean, the K5s or K2s outdated, right? But it's still a, a efficient tool. I've I've only used it uh, when I was on like uh, uh, tours, like in Saint Augustine. But I've never purchased one myself. Right. I mean, that's uh, Michelle's go-to. You know, anytime we go anywhere, that's her. That's her tool. That's her thing. That's yeah. good. Do you do you suppose that uh, you say it's like a group of people? Do you suppose it's some of, some of his uh, patients that's still with him there? I don't think so. I think it's just uh, probably ghosts and spirits from the community. Uh, this past week, I even uh, got words from uh, a ghost and spirit that uh, identified at the Hayes house when I wrote the book, The Hayes House Ghost for People Too. Right. And um, Mary was a, a young lady, uh, well, she lived there, I think she passed away in her late 50s. Mm -hmm. But she um, she had more like a childlike personality. She was a very nice lady, a very polite lady, mm -hmm. and she was living with the Hayes family. And she was unable to, like, be independent and live on her own. Uh, and uh, apparently she enjoyed uh, to color in color, coloring books and to draw with crayons. Right. And I got uh, her a couple times uh, while at Dr. John Gorey's grave. And the Hayes house is only about maybe three blocks from Dr. John Gorey's grave. Right. So... If, if you go to the same place enough time and you start to see a pattern, certain ghosts and spirits will use certain words as a pattern. They may not give you their name, mm -hmm. but they'll, she mentions crayons and liking crayons and uh, interested in crayons and crayons forever. It's like something she enjoys doing. Right. I mean, it's, it's almost a giveaway, you know, a dead giveaway that would, that would be her. I mean, if that was her thing, and that's what you're picking up, and then you, it's safe to assume that's who this is. And it, if you do uh, a lot of paranormal researching, sometimes it's just hit or miss. I mean, in the last, I don't know, I've had an obelisk five an obelisk four during the last maybe nine years right and you run across so many ghosts and spirits that sometimes you really have to sit back and think like at dr john gory's grave and i'm trying to think was it dr john gory's grave or was it one of my other paranormal uh, <laughs> sessions that i was doing at another location right but i got the word uh cube island Okay. And that was a word that I received when I was in uh, Fort Walton Beach. And uh, I was near where the 
Air Force train during World War II. Yeah. And uh, I went there the past two years. And my first time walking down this one road, I, I, this doesn't happen to me very seldom, if, if not the only first and two times this has happened, walking down this road in the same direction, it was almost like a plane was tumbling in the water in front of me. Uh -huh. And I flinched, and then the image was gone. And it was like a, I don't know whether you would call it a premonition, uh, but each time it scared me and I, I thought about it and I said no it's not going to happen a second time <laughs> and of course this year financially I'm not going to have uh, the money to travel to that location right. so this year I won't be there to see if it would happen three times in a row but for two years in a row it happened at the same location walking down the road and uh, it was like the same premonition of a plane hitting the water and then tumbling almost like in an opposite direction then I would assume it had crashed and it was tumbling like towards me oh, yeah. and I had gotten uh, the first year I had gotten the words cube island and I thought well none of the islands around here are called cube, no, cube island. and then I <laughs> got that uh, I say about a week ago mm -hmm. and it, it's on both cube islands um is somewhere located on my youtube channel so they're documented so if you go through all my youtube uh, uh channel uh videos you'll be able to see uh cube island it could have been a year ago but i think it was two years ago i got the word cube island but it might have been last year right and then, of course, I just got it about a week ago. So it's like the same ghost or spirit wants to communicate with me or is communicating with me through the Oblis 5B. And I've already told them, you know, that I, I wouldn't be able to afford to be in the same location that I was in the last two years. So there won't be a third year in a row right. that the premonition can happen. Right. Now, do you think it was? But it was almost like the ghost or spirit wants me to look into that and to bring that up or do a video about it or in some way honor the fact that he or she gave up their life uh, and, you know, had possibly crashed or uh, somehow they want that within my consciousness. Right. Now, do you and think I guess they know I'm a paranormal researcher, so... Do you think maybe, I would imagine they want me to bring it up? What well, what it sounds like to me, and I could be wrong. I'm, you know, that, that wouldn't be unusual. But that kind of sounds to me. Like you said it wasn't near a military base, right? Yes, it was. Okay. So what about the fact that you may be? It was near Eglin. If uh, if you're experiencing uh, residual haunting, you were seeing that military aircraft you know, taking this final dive. Maybe that's what they want you to see. I don't know. Yes. Uh, well, in one way, it's almost like a premonition because for a split second, maybe, I don't know, two seconds at the most, Yeah. two years in a row when I was walking for the first time on that s certain uh, road, same place, I, I saw it, and it's almost like it's really happening for uh, at least two split seconds, and then I realized, no, it's not really happening. Right, that's that's what I but mean. But that was twice, yeah. you know. Yeah, that's what I mean by a residual. I mean, certain places, just these things happen. They're not intelligent. I mean, it's just replaying itself over and over. But it, as, a pre as a premonition, it might be a ghost communicating with me who is actually intelligent. If it was something that I heard or, or saw, you know, and this wasn't, it was almost like it was in my brain, but not in my field of vision. Almost like I was there for oh, that split couple of seconds. I see. Yeah. It's hard to say. Usually when you get residual energy, you're sitting there, you're doing your, uh, paranormal research i like to sit in the middle of the room just like i'm um, having a conversation with you know a real person right and you know you'll usually hear like maybe a knock or footsteps 
Right. And then you know it, it you know it's it's like a unintelligent uh, in the environment is playing it back, right? Uh, whether it be sound or visual, but this is almost like an intelligent ghost is putting this into my head for a couple split seconds as if they're trying to communicate with me. It's not like, you know, I'm hearing a plane crash. And I can't say that I hear anything. It's all visual. Right. So I, I guess it may be residual energy, but usually residual energy doesn't come in that clear to the point where you're, you can see it and you're like flinching because for a couple split seconds, you feel like you're there or you're trying to get out of the way of a plane that's crashed and is tumbling towards you. Right. Yeah, I understand. I, yeah, I see what I see what you. So mean. it's not if it is residual energy. If it is residual energy, it's not the ordinary type of residual energy. Right. Uh, I always feel like the ghosts or spirits willfully communicating that straight into my brain, which is strange because I can't think of any other time that that has happened. Right. You know, I've heard. Uh, you know, like ghosts or spirits say my name, but, uh, and that'll be, you know, real because usually, you know, if someone says my name, I usually say like, yes, you know, cause I think someone's calling my name. Right. And of course there's nobody there. That right there, that make, brings back a memory and that, so long ago. I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, it, it's one of those things where it could be residual energy or it could be intelligent ghosts. It's kind of like on the borderline. Go ahead with what you were saying. Um, what I was going to say, that brought back a memory from years ago, um, back when I was just, just a kid, a, a preteen. Um, I used to walk from my grandparents' house to the uh, convenience store, you know, you know, several blocks away, every you know, every weekend to get the famous Monster Magazine or whatever it was that had come out that, you know, that month. But there was a big, I mean, old growth, huge tree that had grown up and taken up half of the sidewalk, so you had to walk around it, right? And every time I would go go by that tree, wow. well, every time I would go by that tree, I would hear my name whispered, and there was never anyone there, and that scared me to death. I used, to, I would get to the point where I'd just run by the tree <laughs> to get away from it, you know? That that's an old memory. Wow. <laughs> so I have no. Well, idea that's what. cool. There's probably someone, maybe a relative in the past. You know, that tree was probably maybe two or three hundred years old. Right. So someone in the past who was probably related to you right. probably would hang out or, you know, play near that shade tree in the summer. Right. And they probably were just communicating. Yeah, maybe I don't. Did know. it ever happen as an adult? No, that's what I mean. Nothing. No, no. I mean, I get picked on by my wife all the time because I'm the skeptic, and I try to shoot down everything. Well, that's part of what we do. You know, I'm sorry. That's just the way I am. She says I'm not open enough now. I've closed off everything. That's why I don't experience things that she does, and that may be true. But no, as an adult, nothing. But I will never forget that. That it's. I still get. Goosebumps thinking about that. Well, <laughs> that's that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, <laughs> let, let's continue on here. Um, I didn't mean to get off on a on my personal thing there, but uh, have you got a new? Oh no, no, that's that's interesting. I mean, I I wish I would have repetitive situations, you know, where I heard you know a disembodied voice. But all my situations, for instance, one time at the Hayes house when I was living there after uh, Hurricane Michael, uh, which I only lived there like four or five months, I just heard my name being called that one time. Right. And I still don't know. I try to be a, a skeptic too, to see if it could have been someone outside, maybe say, hey, and it just sounded to me like Keith. Right, it carried And on. the neighbor would come home for lunch my neighbor was on the second floor i lived on the third floor attic apartment and maybe it was his tv was on and someone on the tv hollered keith loud enough for me to hear it mm -hmm. but it's good to do that because it lets 
it lets your your paranormal fans know that you're trying to isolate whether it's unexplained or whether it's something that happened that could be paranormal. Right. I mean, a, a perfect example of that. Uh, years ago, we were on an investigation at a covered bridge here in Indiana, and it, you know, of course, you know, there's the, the story, the backstory of it, and all this kind of thing, whatever. But we had set up there, and it was pitch black, except for our flashlights, and but we kept hearing the sound of people talking, and we couldn't understand. Okay, we would we would respond or try to get them to respond, but they never would. Well, come to find out what it was in actuality and reality was there was a house down the, the stream maybe four or five blocks away four or five you know that something like that but they were out there talking and the voices would carry down that stream down the little river whatever you want to call it and we could pick up on that it took us a while to figure that out but that's what that turned out to be and that that has something to do with the water yeah and like if water is uh evaporating uh -huh. and it forms like fog yeah the sound waves will bounce off the water molecules yeah. yep and it'll like amplify yeah <laughs> so you can you can hear someone a good distance away yeah and, and that's what it was that's exactly what it was and we at the time we couldn't figure it out but then after a little bit more a little more research and 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 thinking about it and just you know what is what happened here what was going on boom that's what it was you know that part was solved but also michelle well you know michelle, that michelle was picking up k2 hits out there like crazy and i couldn't i took it from her and i tried to and nothing it just completely dead give it back to her fireworks you know well, I think ghosts and spirits choose who they want to communicate with. Right. And they probably liked her and for some reason <laughs> didn't like you. And they're, they're choicey. People, you know, even though ghosts are dead, they're still people and they still have emotions and feelings. And they choose who they want to communicate with. That could be. And I, I, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you now, part of the reason we were there, it was, it was a, a suicide was committed there. A guy hung himself right from the bridge and me being me I got tired of waiting for a response get tired of nothing happening I did something I usually don't do right but I provoked and I I had a noose made out of some old rope and I threw it around the rafters and I think that that may be the reason he didn't want anything to do with me yeah you're, you're probably right that probably wasn't the best thing to do no. to try to get a response from uh... right and to top it all off now here's here's another interesting thing um, while we were there uh, the uh, county sheriff pulled up to see what was going on what we were doing there and we started talking to him he said yeah he rem remembered right. that case but he also pointed right above him and he said there was another one another person that hung themselves right here right where we were standing wow we didn't know that but yeah but yeah I think uh, I, I did something I shouldn't have yeah. done I pissed them off and they said skip you <laughs> you know well at least you had your wife there and she was getting uh, <laughs> she was. paranormal uh, responses she was and she always does I, it's incredible it's like it, it, it's like almost like she has her cell phone in her pocket and it's going off you know but she doesn't of course it's, it's weird it's very weird I mean, she's in tune. She's right on it almost every time we go. That's crazy. That's good. Yeah. Huh. So, what's going on? Do you have a new book coming out, or are you working on anything like that? No, I'm not sure if I'm going to do another book. It seems like most people who enjoy the paranormal would rather experience it than to read about someone else's uh, paranormal experiences. Right. So uh, I've been spending most of my time just trying to, uh, you know, document my paranormal uh, sessions uh, and try to keep them short, maybe 10 to 15 minutes and put them on YouTube. And right. uh, a lot of times, you know, you, you can never tell what the ghosts or spirits will do or won't do. So I try to put everything on. A lot of times if there's very little activity, 
I'll try to fill the time by asking questions so people can see how I, you know, what my technique is to try to get a response. You never know. Maybe the ghost or spirit might like football. They might like basketball. They might like golf. <laughs> so always be willing to ask a variety of questions. Right. Now what you say is... And that's is, that's what I try to do. And... Um, what, what you say is... is absolutely true um there's been locations that we have went to uh, residential and commercial that we have a great first night and we'll go back and it's just completely dead there's nothing going on at all no matter what you do no matter how long you stay there it's just nothing it's like they all packed up and split you know well i feel that they might be low on energy and at the same time they may not have anything that they want to say right. they might have said it all the first night but I, I try to show people for the most part I usually get very little paranormal activity mm-hmm. or it's so minute that only a trained eye would pick up on it Right. and I would say as of, as of lately my paranormal activity has picked up but I, I like to show people also when it's 15 minutes of just dead air and I'm not, you know, I'm talking, but I'm not getting response. any paranormal activity. Any response, yeah. That way they see that, you know, I don't always get paranormal activity. Right. I mean, that's and a lot is. depends not on the paranormal investigator. A lot depends on are the ghosts or spirits willing to communicate. Right. I mean that's that is the way it is, and that's why we have a problem with a lot of these shows on TV. It, it obviously they have to do things for ratings if they want to keep their show going, but uh, that's just not it's it's not the way it really is, you know. It really isn't. And I'm sure they edit down hours of weeks, you know, weeks, you know, paranormal. Uh, Research right. just to get the good parts the show on TV. Right, and again, I'm sure a lot of the parts are. I, I was on a TV show a while back, and I told my story. I told them what happened. I told them the way it went, and sure enough, when it came out, it was loosely based on what I had told them. You know what I mean? I think everything's like that. We know the boys, the, right. the, the, the Ames, so, dude, the Mountain Monster boys. We we know those guys. We hang out with them and, and you know do their merchandise and everything. The same thing. It's all about ratings. You know what I mean? As far as TV goes. So you weren't part of the TV program, but they kind of took your ideals. No, I was on. I was on. I I told them. I told the producer my story. This is what happened and. This is how it was. So we went and we filmed, and I filmed on camera telling my story, what had happened. Okay. Then it got edited out, certain pieces, and the reenactors, you know, it, 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 you know it's kind of accurate, but not really. Just put it that way. Are, are you allowed to say what program it was? Paranormal Night Shift. Paranormal Night Shift. Yep. I think I've seen that. Yep. They do like hospitals and yes. The, I well, I might be wrong, but I think all of it's uh, they they take the story and they uh, they embellish. always use they other actors. Yeah, they they embellish with their actors. They, they take they take the individual that had this experience. They're filming you. You're right. telling this story, and as you're telling it, their actors, their reenactors, are you know portraying you and what happened and all that kind of thing. Does that make any sense? Did they tell you up front that you wouldn't be, that you wouldn't visually be on or did you think you would visually be on it? No, I was on it. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> they, when it starts out, it's like, oh, it's, just, it's like a lot of others. When it, it, it starts out, you're sitting there in the chair, you got the camera on you, the producer's behind you, uh, cameraman on either right. side of you. She's asking questions. She, you're telling your story, and you're saying that on screen, and then parts of what you're saying is being portrayed by the actors. You know what I mean? You see what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. 
You know, it was a great. Yeah, show. that's that's what I've always seen. I don't think I've ever seen the person who was actually who experienced the situation ever being on the program. But I might be wrong. No, they're, well, the one most usually the people that had the experience are the ones that are interviewed, the ones that are on the TV, telling the story. But then, but then they have their actors playing out the scene. You see what I mean? So they allowed you to be on telling about it. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> at least you got on. I was worried. I didn't think you got on at all. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Paranormal Night Show. I've got a photo on the website there. You know, you know, um, from a while back when I did. I had to fly to. Um, it's been, it's been some time since I saw the show. I don't have regular t- uh, cable TV where I'm at. Right. So it's been some time since I actually saw that show. Right. Yeah. They flew. They flew. Flew. Flew me out to Buffalo, and that's where we sh- shot it. And came back, you know. And it took a year for it to uh, to get picked up by uh, the Travel Channel. Well, that was good. Yeah, it was it was great. I loved it. It was it, I, I would do it again in a heartbeat. I'm just trying to say, I understand where they're coming from because they have to embellish certain things to try to keep those ratings up, you know, to get another another season, or if if you will, you know. But if so, if you, they want to do a, a real right. show, I, no one's going to sit there and watch you doing nothing for 15 minutes. <laughs> you know what I mean? 15, 20 right. minutes, a half an hour, and, you know, it just it wouldn't fly. Well, I find paranormal research to be so intriguing, and when you do get an intelligent response, to me, it just makes my day. So I look at it this way, if, if a TV producer is willing to put in the time and just edit it down and put the best paranormal right. activity right. into a, a TV show right. and base it around history of a person or history of a house or who lived at a certain house right. or the history of a business, I think they can tell a story and make it interesting and then if paranormal activity is low you can always talk about what other people have experienced even if you don't actually experience that activity and if you want to do a reenactment just let everyone know this is a reenactment it's not say Keith Evans doing paranormal uh, research (laughs) at this location right so and I still think it would be interesting uh for people to watch and I you know I think it would get good ratings right it you know it, it was a great show it was fun to do and I mean um th- this one in particular this episode or this program uh it wasn't talking about things that just happened it was talking about experiences that XYZ people had and they're just visually letting you tell your story while they uh while they simulated with their actors. I mean, the guy that played me was, oh, I don't know, maybe in his early 20s or early 30s, which I was way back then when, when this happened. You know what I mean? So you know, it, was, it, it was fun. Right. <laughs> wow. I didn't know they did stuff like that. I figured that they would interview you and then have the actors come in later, but you were actually there when it happened. Right, yeah. They, yeah, we, they, you sit down. There was a, a huge room with, you know, backdrops and all this kind of thing, cameras and, and just equipment everywhere. And you were interviewed by the producer. I mean, she would would coach you, basically, into getting your story out. And then that's it. Then they would go off, get their actors. Did go, you just? Get their actors. Did go, you just? Go on a location and did you just say it? Did you just talk about one situation, yes. or did you talk yeah. about many different no, no, no. paranormal situations? No, just one one situation that happened over a course of two years. It was uh, something really weird that went on at, at the. I used to I used to be uh, security at, at a local um, county park, and that's this is where this is where that incident took place over a period of years it, it, you know, it wasn't just one night it was over over time it kept happening right and, you know, like I say it was that's fun. cool yeah, it was fun it was really fun dude 
I'm sorry, man. I've talked so much about myself now. We're running out of time. So I want to... Uh, where, where can people see your videos? Is it <laughs> Keith, is it KeithEvans.com on YouTube and, and, and what? Uh, let me see. I'm trying to think. <laughs> yeah, sir. Uh, my uh, my uh, YouTube channel... Oh, it's uh, uh, Paranormal Short Sessions by Keith Evans okay. is the name. Okay. So if you go to it, you got to search for... Uh, it's almost like a sentence... Paranormal right. short sessions by Keith Evans. Okay, now can can people find that? If and they it's free. So uh, when I first got on YouTube, I didn't want to subscribe because I thought it was going to cost something. Right. But it's totally free. Right. And my book for those people that uh, are in the USA, my book is only available online at Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Books a million at Walmart, okay. and it might be online at other locations too. Just check around. Right. And if you live in like uh, Australia, Great Britain, Ireland, uh, I've been told that over there they can find my book online at uh, Amazon and eBay. Okay. Now, can can they go to your Facebook page? Does your Facebook page actually have links that they can follow, or or something like that? Well, um, my Facebook page, uh, Facebook shut me down. I guess they didn't like what I was doing paranormal-wise, <laughs> and I still don't understand what I actually did that was wrong. Right. But right now, um, the only uh, uh, Facebook page is uh, just Keith Evans. Right. So you can search for my name, Keith Evans. Right. My Facebook page was uh, at pet cat 2006 but right now uh i don't know whether facebook has me in facebook jail or whether they're just uh not allowing me to post or uh that's weird to the best of my knowledge i don't think anyone can see anything on my uh facebook page oh, that's weird. but uh the only thing they told me in the past is that i had like three thousand followers Right. And they claimed that half of my follow followers were fake accounts. Really? So I don't know if that had something to do with or not. But now I I go to more extremes to just get people to follow me without accept them, accepting them as a friend. Right. Because, uh, you know, it, on Facebook, you can only mainly reach about 60 to 90 people. So a lot of times, if you take on a new person and they're a fake account or they fizzle out and just don't spend any time with you, right? Then you're losing someone that you really, that really you know, has really, really liked and, follow and follows you, you right. might get tossed off, right? Yeah. And then you just think they they gave up on you or no longer care to watch, <laughs> right? So, and I'm also on Instagram, right? Okay, okay, guys, Keith Evans. Our old buddy here, we're going to have you back on if that's okay with you, right? Yeah, that would be great. Are, are we pretty much done for tonight? Yeah, we're, 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 we're over, actually. We're uh, just a little bit over, and I, I want to thank you for coming back on, and thank you for being so patient with our, uh, patient with our audio trouble we're having. But, uh, yeah, we will get you rescheduled again because we want to talk some more. Yeah, I mean, it just seemed like time went so fast, and I, I know it barely did. talked about <laughs> me. just a few things I did within the last couple of weeks. I know, I know. That's why, I, I, that's why I apologize. I yeah, that off. would be great. I, I enjoyed being your guest. Okay, that's that's why I apologize. I got off on myself like some stupid tangent. Of, you know, oh. it, you know, it happens. I'm sorry, but we will have. Oh, no back. problem. I, I found everything you said to be interesting. <laughs> yeah. Well, check out the show. Pam. And I, I enjoyed listening to what happened to you during the. Uh, Go ahead. I, I enjoyed uh, hearing as to what happened during the TV program. Oh, that yeah. was interesting. Well, that's that's what I was going to say. Um, it just Google it. Uh, Google Paranormal Night Shift, and all the episodes will come up. You can click on those and check them out if you want to. Okay. All right, man. Thank you again for coming on, and we that will. Sounds good. I will. Okay, and we will talk to you soon. Yep. All right. Bye. All right. Thanks for having me. If you've enjoyed this episode, share it with your friends. This is the Dead Zone Paranormal Radio Show. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.